So we are going to close out the book of Romans tonight. And um, we're going to call the title of our time tonight, we're going to call it Before I Close. <clears throat> Before I Close. This has been kind of a cool study. We've been in the, this book for 15 weeks. And one of the things that I think that has just been so neat about this study is, is that Paul was writing it to a church that he didn't know. And it's, it's so cool how he's, he didn't really know us either, but it was still so applicable for us. And um, it's kind of neat to, to watch how he tries to close this out. It's kind of like when you're having a really good conversation with somebody that you're just on the same page with, and then you, you just keep saying like, okay, one more thing, one more thing. Oh, wait, before you leave, let me tell you one more thing. And that's exactly what Paul does here. He tries to close his letter like five times. And every time that he does it, he's kind of like he comes in with, okay, but let me tell you one more thing. Let me tell you one more thing. And I love it because, number one, I'm like that a lot. You know, sometimes I start closing a message, and you, you guys know, you know, half an hour later, we're still on, and, you know, how did we even? It's just like that's his, his heart is to just give exhortation, exhortation, exhortation. And um, so we get to enjoy that tonight. Paul has covered some difficult teaching, and he's going to talk about it within the, the close of this letter. He's going to say, listen, guys, I was bold with you. And I think that that's a neat thing. And I think that as we go back and we look at some of the tough topics that we've gone over, I think that we have felt that too. You know, when you look at the book of Romans, as we've talked about, it's known as one of the most confusing, I mean, the most deep letters or books of the Bible. But most people would look at it and say, that's, I mean, that Romans just goes right over my head. I can hang out in Ephesians. I can get into Philippians. But when you're talking about Romans. And so we've, we've enjoyed that with Paul. That some of it is a little bit difficult to understand. And we had to try to make it as simple as possible. And Paul's going to talk about that tonight. But what I love about how he closes this is that it's, it's like he's getting our eyes back on what's important. And that's Jesus. He mentions Jesus or Lord or Jesus Christ almost 30 times. It's like 25, 30 times within these last two chapters. And I love that. Because not, you know, it's the object of why he's writing this letter. And it's like before he goes, okay, I know you might have gotten tripped up on a little bit about the Holy Spirit and what that looks like. And we're talking about Gentiles and Jews and how you guys interact together. And how does a stronger Christian hang out with a weaker Christian? But listen... We've gone through all of this together because I want you guys to become more like Jesus. And I want you to worship Jesus. And that's kind of how his, a little bit of his heart. And so it's neat because he keeps going back and he's just like, it's like he can't stop talking about the Lord. And that's cool because not only is it the object of this chapter, not only is it the object of this book, but it helps us to understand that it's the object of all of Scripture. And that's exactly what we've done through this, through this teaching. Week one, we talked about being unashamed of Jesus. Week two, we talked about what is the effects of God's wrath and what does that look like and why we're so thankful that Jesus came. Then we talked about our problem personally with sin and how Jesus can help us out of that. And then we talked about how everybody has a problem with sin and we're not alone in this. And everybody needs to know Jesus. And week by week, we have looked at, okay, what does this big topic mean in relation to Jesus? Jesus makes Christianity different than any other religious system because Jesus alone is the one uh, religion, and I always struggle to say with religion because sometimes we get lumped into different things, but it's the one religion where it's about a person. And so Paul's going to help us to understand, listen, the, the thing about the difference between Judaism and Christianity or Christianity or anything else is that this is a person, an actual person that came down from heaven and lived. And he is the object of our worship. And all of the rules and everything else, it just points to him. But it's like he's getting us back to this point of just going, guys, worship the person of, of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So we'll look at, I think we have like seven or eight points. Some of them we'll go through pretty quick. Some of them will take us a little bit longer. But um, we're going to try to zip through um, a little bit of what we did last week and, um, uh, and finish out 
uh, chapter 16. So let's dig into it. We're going to go back to chapter 15, verse 1. Let's finish out the letter in Pauline fashion. As he's going to try to close several times. And he's going to continue to encourage us. But let's look at verse 1. He says, we went over this last week, but I, there's a couple of things that I wanted to chat about. Okay, he says, We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, for as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So the first kind of little encouragement that he's going to end with, and this will be point number one, is please not yourself. Please not yourself. Now he's talked about Christian liberty and Christian freedom and how, how wonderful that is to have this freedom. But then he talks about how you need to be able to sacrifice that for those that are weaker than you. And you might have come away from last week's teaching going, that's right, I'm free. I'm free. And I mean, Romans chapter 8, that's absolutely what we talked about. We are free in Christ. But then as you started to think about it throughout the week, I bet you started to realize, boy, the thing that's interesting about that is that Jesus was the most free man, but yet he sacrificed everything for us. I mean, who would have done that? Who would have left heaven, perfect freedom, holiness, to come and take all of our sin upon him? First encouragement that he has is, listen guys, please not yourself. And the example that we have is Jesus. We should, look, we should look to walk with those that are weaker because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. So what I was thinking about was, um, so my, my grandpa, my grandma my grandpa, they started skiing when they were, oh boy, let me get this back up. <clears throat> Actually, let's just turn this off. It's going to get crazy with music. So they started skiing when they were in their 60s. All right, you say, well, that's a, that's a wonderful feat. I haven't heard of many people that have started skiing in their 60s. Well, here's one of the cool things about my grandpa. Not only did he start skiing when he was in his 60s, but he was legally blind. All right? It was one of the most amazing things that I've ever been a part of. And actually, I have the picture on my phone. And so what would happen was my grandpa, his, some, early on in his life, he, he got this disease and he was blinded up to like 90-something percent. But he still lived in his life. He had a very successful construction company. And so when my grandma started skiing, he would stay in the lodge. And at one point, my grandma said, hey, why don't you come and do this with me? And he said, Okay. And so what they used to do, how cool is this? Actually, I'll pull it up. My grandma, she used to go in front of him, and she took her ski suit, and she put a big diamond on the back of her jacket. And then he would follow because he could see just enough. And let's see, I have the... Okay, so this is my grandma and grandpa, which my grandpa's no longer with us. And this is my Mimi, who's come sometimes. But then he would follow her, and it was, it was just enough. And I was thinking about, man, what a picture of what it looks like for somebody who is stronger to come along somebody that is weaker. And physically, you know, she didn't have to do that. She could have, you know, just... Who would want to slow down to go with a person that is blind? Well, a really good wife, right? And I thought about, man, is that not a great picture of what it's supposed to be like for us? Sometimes we look at somebody that is weaker and we like to almost come and make fun of them. That would be like my grandma making fun of my grandpa because he couldn't see. But she didn't look at things that way. She just started looking at, oh, no, 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 no. I can come alongside and help him because I'm stronger in this way. And that's exactly how we should be thinking about how it is for us in the Christian life. Is that looking on at those that may be a little bit weaker and going, okay, in what area am I stronger that I can come alongside and help them? Jesus did not leave, lead a pleasing life to himself. Think about that. His life on earth was not one that was lived to please himself, but it was one of sacrifice for those that are weaker. Our example and our encouragement is Jesus. Our freedom should be enjoyed, but if it starts to trip up others, we need to look at it and evaluate it. Jesus didn't trip up anyone over his freedom. Realize that Jesus' teaching in his ministry was and is the perfect application of the Old Testament teaching. 
Okay, so if you ever wonder, boy, how do you apply Old Testament teaching? Just look at the life of Jesus. Because not only did he apply the Old, te- the Old Testament um, teachings in his life perfectly, but he also showed us what does Christian liberty look like. And so the first point is, please not yourself. Let's move on to verse 4. He says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now may the hope of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be with one mind and one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Paul points the church to the Scriptures. How wise is that? It's a good and it's a wise word from a pastor that understands the ways of things. And you've got to realize this is a guy that is incredibly far away from this church. And he can't be there to talk and to go over things and go, hey guys, this is, he'd love to be there, but he can't. And I think that that's so cool and this is such a wise word for all of us is, listen guys, the beautiful thing about Christianity is that you can now go to the Lord and you guys can have the relationship where He talks to you. And how that happens with us is that we get into our Bibles. That's how He can speak to us today. So He points us to the Scriptures. And He says, listen, He kind of breaks it down for us. Number one, Scriptures were for our learning. God has told us all that we will ever need to know in His Word. He tells us who we are. He talks about that He knows the number of hairs on our heads. He talks about how He loves us. And isn't that amazing? Every single one of us that's in here tonight, He loves us so much. And He knows the reason, you know, or the, 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 the number of hairs that are on your heads. He, he knows why He gave you the color eyes that He gave you. And He knows your giggle because He's the one that gave it to you. And your ugly cry, you know, the sounds that you make when you absolutely sob, He's the one that supplied that to you. And the things that sometimes drive you crazy about yourself, those are some of the things that He has given to you and that He loves. And when you go into Scripture, you start to realize, man, He knows everything about me. He knows you better than you know yourselves. He also tells us about who He is in Scripture. That's another thing that's just amazing, is that we get to start to... We get to realize that how big and how powerful and how wonderful that He is. He also tells us our purpose, why we were created. It's one of the most asked questions in Google every year is, who am I and why am I here? The Scriptures give us all of those answers. We are made in the image of God. That's who we are. We're supposed to be walking with Him, that we can be His children. It also tells us why we were created so that others could could come to know Him. And what I love about it is that it gives us guidance and direction. I was talking to somebody this week and I said, you know, talking about, well, you know, I I don't know if I even want to read the Word. And I said, listen, just go to the book of Proverbs. There's 31 of them. You can read one for every day of the month. That's the beautiful thing about the Word is that you can pick all kinds of different ways to get into it. But the main thing is, is just get into the Word. He also says that the Scriptures, they will bring patience and comfort. Patience is a funky word. It's one of those things that people say, don't ever pray for patience, because God's going to bring you the tribulation, right? But the thing is, is that as you read the Scriptures, you realize patience, another word for patience is long-suffering. And God is a God that suffers long. As you read the Scriptures, you're going to understand how to do suffering or patience well. The other thing is that the Scriptures bring comfort. Isn't that awesome? That when you're struggling and on your worst days, the Lord has a verse for where you are. Be still and know that I am God. What a comforting Scripture, even when things go the worst that you could ever think of. There's Scripture for that. And then he says that we might have hope. The scriptures bring hope. Hope in all things, earthly and heavenly. 
The thing is, is that when you figure out that death is dead and that there is hope in salvation, well, it changes the way that we look at things earthly. So the second thing that Paul does is that he promotes the Scriptures. He says, listen guys, get into the Word because that's where you're going to start to hear from the Lord. Let's move on, verse 7. He says, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us. To the glory of God, now I say that Christ Jesus has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. Now point number three, or what do we see him do now? He's going to talk about the promises of God. What does Paul mean when he says Jesus Christ became a servant to the circumcision? Well, we know when we talk about the circumcision that we're talking about Judaism. Okay, so, so what we have to remember is that God promised a Messiah. And in the promising, He said that He would bring forth a nation to give birth to this Messiah. The Messiah, which is Jesus, has a very special relationship with the Jewish people because of what He had already promised them, to do, promised them that He would do. Now what's interesting with us, and I'm going to guess that almost all of us are Gentiles in here. Is there anybody here that is Jewish? We all Gentiles in here, right? So what's interesting about that is God didn't make covenants with us. Okay, the Jewish people, He came along and He gave them promises and covenants. Even when they couldn't hold up their end of the bargain, God still kept up His. See, we didn't really come in until after Jesus was born. And so Paul is going to give us four scriptures from the Old Testament to talk about what does it look like for the Gentiles. What's interesting about the Gentiles is that we get to celebrate that God in His mercy brought us in because He didn't promise us any of that. Different than He did with the Jews. So as you go through and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see that Jesus in His time was very specific to the Jewish people. You know, that was really His ministry was He didn't hang out too far away from from the nation of Israel. He was always centered there because that was his ministry. The Gentiles would come in afterwards. And now Paul's going to give us some scripture that's going to talk about that. He says in verse 9, And the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you people. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. Okay, you say, well, what in the world did Paul just do there? Okay, so let's break down what what Paul just brought in. Okay, so he reinforces God's plan to bring the Gentiles and the Jews together. Now remember, for for the Roman church, this was probably a tough concept for them to figure out. He's going to reinforce it just real quick. And basically what he does is he brings four Old Testament scriptures together. And he sums it up through the three divisions that are already in the Old Testament. Okay, So you have the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. And so he grabs a verse from each section to share with them God's relationship with the Gentiles. Okay, So the first one is, is that he grabs 2 Samuel 22 and 50. This is David's song of deliverance. After that, he grabs from Deuteronomy, from the law, and from Moses, where he's going to talk about the Gentiles. And then, I don't know if you guys noticed, from, he also grabs from Psalm 117. And if, you, if you don't know what Psalm 117 is, it's the shortest chapter in the Bible. Right, so he even grabs that one. And another fun fact about Psalm 117 is that it's like the middle, it's like the middle of the Bible. But if you ever want to impress somebody and say, listen, I have a whole chapter of the Bible memorized, it's like four or five verses or four or five sentences. <clears throat> and then he also grabs Isaiah. And what's neat about that is that Jesus made a way for the Gentiles. Even though he didn't have to, he did. And he even talked about it in the scriptures. And so Paul, again, is hopefully just helping them understand, guys, listen, Jew and Gentile, I know it's tough to figure out, but listen, there was a plan for the Gentiles, even while there were promises for the Jews. This is an important principle in our church life. 
But more importantly, um, actually, let me back up. I think that it's really important how Paul teaches this section. Okay, because number one, there's a couple things that we can pick up from what Paul just did. Number one is that he probably didn't have all of the scrolls laying around. We start to notice that Paul was a real student of Scripture. But the second thing is, is that the way that he taught the Bible was he pulled Scripture and taught about the Scripture. And that is so important for us as a church, and it's important in your own life. Is that if you want to hear from God, the best place to go is is the Scriptures. Okay, let's move on. Verse 13, he says, Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, point number four, Paul's encouragement is on the personality of God. Now, I think verse 13 is the first time that he really is saying like, okay, I'm going to, this is my this is my last little thought. Because doesn't it just sound like the end of a letter? Okay, now may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's probably about to say, you know, amen, you can be dismissed, or something like that. And that's not exactly what happens, but I was chewing on that this week, and I was thinking, man, if we could figure those things out, how secure you would be on your foundation. May the God of hope, again, if we know that eternity is, is finalized, that we can have Jesus forever, He's the God of that. He's the God that created a way when there was no way. And that's the one that we serve. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. I was sharing with somebody this week. She was asking about, but I don't feel very happy. I don't feel happy. I'm struggling with happiness. And I said, well, happiness is a funky thing. Happiness can be taken by anybody. I could give you a check right now for $10,000 and you would be incredibly happy until you went to the bank and realized that I didn't have $10,000 in my bank. And then you would be very unhappy. You see, I can take it just like that. Joy is different. Jesus Christ gives joy. And once you have joy, that can't be taken from you. You see, they, they stoned Paul. He was still filled with joy. Still want to go tell other people about Jesus. And they beat him. And he still had joy. He even thought it was a blessing. And they threw him in jail. And remember what he wrote in Philippians? In jail, he said, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I said, again, I say rejoice. That's the beautiful thing about joy is that once you realize that Jesus gives out joy, nobody can take that. And so Paul is saying, listen... May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And what's the opposite of peace? The opposite of peace is anxiety. So now when we ever get anxious, what we need to realize is anxiety can come from the enemy, but peace comes from Jesus. And so if we're ever struggling with anxiety, we can go to the Lord because He is the God of peace. And then it says, in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Spirit. This would have been a really great place to end, but then Paul keeps going. So let's move on. Verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus, in the things which pertain to God, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and in deed, to make the Gentiles obedient, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about to Iconium, 
I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and so I made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and to those who have not heard shall understand. Point number five, Paul's going to talk about his preaching and his teaching of God. Paul's confident that the church is able to handle this teaching. Okay, so he talks about it. He goes back. He says, listen, I've written to you more boldly on some points. As reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. And so he's just going to circle back and he's just going to make sure that everybody's okay. Listen, I know that I might have beat you up with a couple of these messages or these points or these chapters. But listen, I, I'm doing this. So that you can become more like Jesus. And I think that that's an important thing. And my guess is that there were some weeks over the last 15 weeks where you went, boy, that is a tough, tough chapter. Or man, what was up with Ben tonight? He was really pouring it on. Listen, I do that for the same heart as Paul. Because I want us to become more like Jesus. All right, Romans, uh, our, our, our first study, or our second study Romans chapter 1 was probably one of the toughest studies that we've ever done. But the reason why we did it is, number one, it's in God's Word and we should talk about it. But number two, I don't want us to be ignorant of the things that are going on in our society. The book of Romans is one right now that most of the the church is scattered on. There's some issues that are in there that they're fighting over. Okay, does it mean this? Does it mean this? Does it mean this? We shouldn't be ignorant in those things. We should dive into these scriptures and know what is the heart of Paul. What was going on in Rome or Corinth while he was writing this? And what does that mean for our church today? A lot of churches right now are calling Romans too offensive. And listen, I would say the same thing that Paul said. Listen, we were bold. I know we were bold in this teaching. Right, but, that, but, but, but it's so that you can know more about the Lord. And he, 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 he follows that with reminding you of grace. And I think that that's such a wonderful thing. It's because of grace that we're able to do all of this. You, know, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can go to the Lord over the, the verses that you struggle with. But what's awesome is that God gives us grace that we didn't deserve. And that's why this is just so wonderful. And then Paul goes on and he talks about, listen, his heart was never to build on another man's foundation. Now this is an interesting, super interesting thing for him to be talking about. Because Paul took the gospel to places and countries that had never had it before. Okay, but still he said, listen, I don't ever want to tread on another man's ground. And that, and why I bring that up and why we, we talk about that is that that's the heart of Calvary Tiffin. One of the reasons that when Megan and I were praying and talking about planning a church, at one point we thought we were going to be planning a, a Calvary Chapel in Pittsburgh. But then we realized that there was a Calvary Chapel in Pittsburgh. Okay, that's not going to work. And then we thought, well, maybe it's Columbus. Then we realized that there's a Calvary Chapel in Columbus. And then, you know, we never wanted to talk about Tiffin. Like, we're not going back. But then we realized there wasn't a Calvary Chapel within basically 60 to 70 miles of Tiffin. It was like this big, huge circle. that They were everywhere except in this area. And that's one of the reasons that we knew was looking at the heart of Paul. Why would we go somewhere where they already have a Calvary Chapel? We might as well just go and be a part of that Calvary Chapel. Our heart was to bring a church in a place that could connect like we were able to connect in South Florida. So it's interesting because Paul shares it, but even Paul, even if he did have a a ministry right next to somebody else, I mean, for Pete's sake, he took the gospel to continents. But yet he still shared, listen, I don't ever want to just park right up against somebody else's ministry and start. I don't want to do that. It's just not my heart. Let's keep going. 
Verse 22, he says, For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia to Acacia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, When I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness and the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, And that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That I may come to you with joy by the will of God. And to be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Point number five that we see is that Paul is going to share his plans. This is kind of cool because we get to see the human side. Most of Romans we look at kind of the heavenly side. That God is... The inspiration to write this. But here we get to see Paul just being Paul. Now we know, because of church history, that Paul's going to go to Rome. Remember, that's how we ended our study in Acts. The only difference is he's going to be taken there in chains. Now whether he went and got to hang out with them while he was in Rome, we don't know. But we do know that he's going to be killed there. So it's interesting because he has this heart and this longing to get there. Little does he know that he's going to get there in a much different way than he had thought. Um, Another thing that he talks about in here is bringing this contribution. And another thing that we have to remember from our study in Acts is, do you remember when they all started becoming believers and they sold off everything and they brought it into a big pot and they just, you know, basically we're going to let you, we're just praising the Lord, have it. Well, the sounded wonderful. The only problem is they all went broke. Okay, and the church in Jerusalem was poor. And so Paul started going to all of these Gentile churches, and he was raising money to take back to Jerusalem. So whenever they talk about this gift that he's giving, or, hey, I want you to give, hey, I want you to give, or if it's in your heart to give, that's exactly what he's talking about. And it's kind of a neat thing that you have this church in Jerusalem, and you know that they're struggling with Jewish and Gentile. But when Paul is able to bring a gift from a Gentile church to the Jewish church, I bet that it was such an interesting blessing for them. Why would they do that? Why would they do that for us? You know, they're still having trouble. You know, if you become a Christian, you have to become circumcised, and they're trying to make them all become circumcised. And just imagine what that conversation had to be like. And this is a way for Paul to bring blessing to his Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, let's move on to chapter 16. He then says, I command you, I commend you to Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sancria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Now, the sixth thing that we'll see here is that he's pleading for them to greet these these workers of his. And this is a really neat section. If you were to circle the word for servant after Phoebe, that's where we get our word deacon, or that's where we get our title of deacons within the church. A deacon or a deaconess. Some churches believe that women can't be deacons or deaconesses. You can point right to Romans 16, because Phoebe, we see here, was, was a deaconess. Or a servant. Okay, now we're going to get into a section that has some pretty tough pronunciations. But I have brought my pronunciation key 
and we're going to kind of rip through this. Now, if I butcher any of them, I just want to let you know the warning was coming, but Paul is basically going to talk about all the brothers and sisters that have helped him along the way. So he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also to the churches of the Gentiles. Now listen to this, and I, I circled this verse, and it was probably a long time ago when we were in our house, but it, listen to what he says in verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Right, People that are haters on the, the home churches, listen, you could, you could go to Romans 16.5. Paul is it's biblical. Greet my beloved... Oh boy, Epatius, <clears throat> who is in the first fruits of Acacia to Christ, great Mary. Okay, that's a nice, easy one. Who labored much for us? Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles who are in in Christ before me. Greet Ampelius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet. Or Banius, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved, greet Ampelus, approved in Christ, greet those who are of the household of Eratobulus, greet Herodon, my countrymen, greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord, <clears throat> greet Tryphana. Now, if you ever want to look for baby names, you could definitely come here for some, uh, some ones that aren't originals. In Triphosis, who have labored in the Lord, greet the beloved Pierces, who labored much in the Lord, greet Rufus, true, chosen in the Lord. Okay, so ben, most of you didn't know that Rufus was a biblical name. In his mother and mine, greet, <clears throat> oh boy, oh, Syncretius, and Phlegon, and Hermas, and Petromus, and Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philogus, and Julia, Neresis, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss to the churches of Christ. Greet you. Okay, good. We made it through that part, right? couple things to note. Even though those are some tough names to pronounce, I think that it is so cool that Paul spent a good bit of this letter just shouting out some brothers and sisters. And he's an encourager. Would, would, would we expect anything else from Paul? Just to shout out those, oh man. You can only imagine if we were to go like on a mission trip or if I was to send all of you guys down to Fort Lauderdale. Listen, Listen, greet Trisha and, and greet Mary Kay. Greet Trish, greet Trisha, greet, greet Dominic and Nicole. Listen, these are my brothers and my sisters in the word. And, you know, it's the same exact way that we would do it. And I think that it's so cool that it's in there because we also get to just see that, that human side to Paul. I think we also get a little window into what his personal life was like. Isn't it neat when you think about that he, the letters 1st and 2nd Timothy were just him encouraging another brother. Romans is him encouraging the church in Rome. And nobody else just had that heart for other believers like Paul did at the time where he's just sending these letters, man. And I just think that it's so cool and such a good example for us. And also look at his discipleship. There's a lot of people named there. He was always pouring into people. Shouting them out, listen, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And he has such wonderful things to say. One of the reasons that we look at discipleship in the way that we do is because Paul was a discipler, just like Jesus. And one more thing is that he valued fellow workers. I love that. I just think that it's so cool that he's giving them shout outs. Okay, we got two more left. Verse 17, he says, Now I urge you, brethren... Note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. 
But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, this is the third time that he tries to end it, right? Just in our time together. I love this. I think this is such a cool section of scripture. He's saying, listen, avoid those who cause division and offense contrary to what you've learned. Oh man, what a good word for us today. Look out for those that are causing division. You only need to be on social media for 10 seconds to understand what it's like to cause division. Anything comes out, there's somebody already hating on it or trolling it. What is that doing? It's causing division. And it's contrary to what we've learned. Know that those who cause division do not serve the Lord Jesus. Paul makes a a good point of that here. But then he says, may the God of peace. And I love that he reinforces this again. Paul will talk about that peace a little bit more in Philippians 4. He says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. See, God can give peace that we don't even understand. He's just, I, I, don't know, I don't know why I have peace. It's just that the, that the Lord gives you peace in such terrible situations sometimes because He's the God of peace. He's the Prince of Peace. I think it's interesting that he says in verse 20, in the God of peace, and then he ends it by saying, we'll crush Satan under your feet. You know, you, you almost think of that and go, wait a minute, did he? You have, you have peace, but then you have crushing somebody under your feet. Is that is that like a like two opposite, like peace and, and crushing? You almost feel like shouldn't be right next to each other. You look at the one of the definitions of peace is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so what's what's amazing about that is part of our peace is knowing that Satan is going to be crushed. That it's over. The battle is, the, the, the war is, is won. And although he can hurt us physically while we're here, he can take people away from us, he cannot have us. You know, we're, we're Jesus's. That means that our eternity and our salvation is done. It's finished. And you can remind him of that anytime that he tries to pester you. Listen, bro, my eternity is sealed. Do you want me to remind you of yours? That is peace. Knowing that whew, I, I, can't, I can't be moved. When it comes to my eternity, it is set. That's peace. The troubles of the present time will not last forever. Jesus will crush Satan under his feet. And I love that he ends up, may the God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, this is a typical ending for Paul, but again, it's not his ending. If you go through his letters all the time, he ends it with peace. He actually starts both of his letters with peace, too, and we talked about that at the very beginning. Peace, grace, or grace, I'm sorry, grace is what I meant to say. Grace. Grace and peace, grace, grace, grace. And he ends it with grace. I love it because grace is just awesome like that. And here's how he ends. He says, Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason. Again, did you know that Jason was a biblical name? Look at that. Mm -hmm. And Sapha, Peter, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tortilius, so this is going to talk about the person who actually penned the letter, One of the things that we had talked about in Acts was that we're not sure of the injuries that Paul had, but one of them was that his eyes may have been bad. Okay, So he may not have been able to write. And so this guy, um, for whatever reason, came alongside Trulius. He wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. So again, he's shouting out people again. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, he greets you. And Cordus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You think, oh man, that's wonderful. Another ending. 
Okay, I got one more thing. Verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept, kept secret since the world began, <clears throat> but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to faith, to God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Man, what a, what a powerful punch to end this letter. He says, to him who is able. And isn't that a cool thing to think about? If there's anybody that could establish you, if there's anybody that could keep you, it's Jesus because he's able your toughest problem that you're going through or the thing that you look on as impossible, is God able to deal with that with you? Yes. Is there any sickness that Jesus isn't able to cure? Or even death. He took care of that. And so I love that he brings that up at the end. Listen, to him who is able... Okay, get your eyes back on Jesus. No matter what you're dealing with right now, take it to the one who is in control of it all. Again, he talks about to establish. Man, think about what this church has gone through in a short amount of time. Okay, Jesus t- tells them, okay, listen, I want you guys to, to go. Go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go. And remember, Jesus had a local ministry. He didn't go to all the world. He just trained up basically, what, 11 11 guys, ladies, maybe a group of 50, 100 that he really got to spend time with. He says, okay, now you guys take it to the whole world. And it's not that many decades until it happened. Paul we read in in Acts is seeing the ministry go to Asia in Europe. How does that how does that happen, right? Only by Jesus. Okay, the, the governments tried to, to crush Christianity and then it just kind of just kept exploding. So who's able to establish a ministry? Jesus. So that's the way that we believe here. Who's the one that's going to establish Calvary Chapel Tiffin? Jesus. Who's the one that's going to sustain it? Jesus. Who's the one that's going to bring people? Jesus. Who's the one that's going to do whatever it is that we're going to do here? In Jesus, right? That's why we're always praying, Lord, bring people, put people in our path that you want. Because we're going to be fine with whoever that is. Because Jesus is the one that establishes. Jesus is the one that maintains. To God alone be wise, be glory, through Jesus Christ, amen. Now we started this study 15 weeks ago. And we've been relating it to our day. We started out in week one how we talked about that Paul, okay, when he wrote this letter, the biggest media that he had was letter writing. And today it would be like, for us, social media. Hey, some people will say, well, you know, if, if Jesus had a social media or if Paul had social media, then people, haters, come in and say, well, Jesus would never have a social media or Paul would never have a social media. Paul, I'm going to guess, would have had a social media just because he was like the original social media guy. You want to talk about a post that went viral. This is the most, one of the most read letters of all time. And the question that we asked in the first study and this is where we'll end is, if Paul had an Instagram account, would you follow it? If Paul posted his thoughts, would you share it? The letter is arguably the most viral post of all time. Now, you'll post a dog doing tricks, right? But will you share the truths some of the most important truths that we've gone over for the last 15 months, will you share those? Okay, we also asked in verse 1, if Jesus had an Instagram post, would you follow it? 
Or would you be a ghost follower? We talked about that in week one. He said, well, what in the world is a ghost follower? A ghost follower is somebody that follows a person, you know, like say, you know, like maybe you follow Justin Bieber, but you don't actually want your friends to know that you follow Justin Bieber, so you just search in his name, but you don't actually follow him. The question that we asked is, are you that way with Jesus? Do you go and search in Jesus whenever you need him? Are you a ghost follower? Are you one that says, listen, I'll follow him. When he gives you a scripture and he puts something on your heart for another person, do you share it? If you come in contact with somebody tomorrow that goes, man, I feel incredibly anxious. Will you share with them? Listen, I read this yesterday in the book of Romans that God is the God of comfort. He is the God of peace. Will you share him? was the question that we started and it's the question that we'll end with. You say, well Ben, what what does that look like practically for me? Here's a great way that you can start. Okay, go back to verse 13. This is where we'll end, I swear. See, I'm doing it just like Paul did. I was supposed to end already. If you go back to verse 13. Write down verse 13 on on a card tonight. And just put it in your back pocket and say to the Lord, Lord, I have a verse of hope and joy and peace. Bring me somebody that needs to know this. Okay, I did this one time. I didn't do this really on purpose, but I had written down a verse. I don't remember exactly what it was, but let's just say that it was this verse. And I would walk to work and I would try to memorize a verse while I would get there and I remember I got to work and I had a coworker that started talking about how anxious they were. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, I was reading about something like this today and I tried to tell them the verse and I couldn't remember it. And I just took out this, I said, you know what, I have this thing that I wrote down and let me just, and I just said, here, let me give it to you. And after that I realized, wow, when I woke up this morning and wrote this down, I actually thought it was for me. But then the Lord just took that and he used it. And if, what, a handful of us would put verses and give them out to people every day, think about what the Lord could do with that. Think about how many people in Tiffin need to know about hope and joy and peace. And we have to unleash the book of Romans. We have to unleash Jesus because that's where the power is. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful.